Cool. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, 8 o'clock in the morning here in Lanzarote on the 13th of September. It's 9 o'clock in France and uh, uh, must be 7 o'clock UTC. So uh, a few things happening on the track. But before I get there, I just noticed some messages from Elias there on the uh, social media feed here. Uh, this little little box on the side that you can pop out and pop back in. He was just uh, a bit concerned about uh, some of the information coming off the um, the uh, leaderboard and so on uh, to give you data and off the entrant boxes. And I thought it was maybe worth an explanation. Uh, or you know, you can pull the leaderboard out as though the the teams out here to see uh, exactly what's happening and who's uh, the boats and what colours they represent. And then if you click the other one, you'll get the leaderboard. So there's a couple of things, first of all, to understand if you're not familiar. The tracking information coming from the boats comes from a, a little unit, uh, looks like a hockey puck on the back of the boats. It's called a YB3I. And it sends a signal to the Iridium satellites and back down, and then they calculate the position and between the position of the previous uh, satellite uh, you know, data, you'll get an average speed and average course over the four hour period and that gives you your, you know your, your raw information uh, um, oh, i've got an information thing here um, so uh, we can control that with the console and the computer so we actually as organizers can increase or decrease the uh, rate of any boat's data output so if we if they're closing a film drop and we want to get their positions every hour we can do that uh, remotely but the actual program, everything, all the information that comes off of here on the uh, leaderboard and the boxes that you've got is controlled by an automatic program, obviously um, you know, software package written by Yellowbrick, the owners of the system who provide us this tracking uh, here as part of our overall contract for the, for the duration of the race. And it's really good, we find it really effective, but every now and then you get a bit of a glitch and uh, uh, the glitch is usually solved automatically with the own sort of uh, built-in sort of uh, uh, program itself. So when you, if you have got a, a, a bad sort of set of data for one particular boat, don't despair, it's usually sorted automatically by the time they get the next position four hours later. We're running a four hour track right now and as they close Lanzarote, some of them will, will drop them back to about an hour. Um, so that's the first thing to remember, that, that it is automatic and, and it does sort of look after itself. The other thing to remember on the course, the, the, the data itself, every time you see a little red dot like that on Lanzarote, which is where they're going, it's an inshore mark, that they're going to round, and then you've got this rum line track. All of the data in terms of um, calculating uh, the VMGs or the vector made good is done based on this track here. So if a boat is heading out to the side, you might find that it's not closed any distance to the finish, even though it's sailing through the water. So you're always focused on the objective of getting to the next mark, and uh, that can even get confusing. If I if I drop back here. If I go back to the thing, if they've got to turn a corner, or it's pretty straight, uh, like down here, then the course will be calculated around here and then to the uh, to back into Cape Town. But some of the yachts may end up sailing straight like this to follow the weather and around, so they're not actually sailing this course, which is used to calculate their actual data uh, that's put on this um, uh, leaderboard. So if we look at the leaderboard, I'll just summarise again, just so you're clear. First of all, where it says the name, that's obvious, Simon Kerwin. Handicap, there is no handicapping for us, but this is a standard uh, table, you might say. So forget about the handicapping, there is no handicap, it's the first boat home wins. Um, when you come over here, you've got the start time, which was obviously 4th of September at 1400 UTC, and the last position received. So that'll tell you the last um, clear data coming off the boats. The next one, DTF, that's distance to the finish. Okay, so at the moment for Simon, who's leading, he's got 25,487 nautical miles. And then the distance sailed, that's distance sailed from the start, following that red run line. So the boat itself may have sailed a lot more than that, but in terms of making good towards the finish uh, and on that run line, uh, it's only at 857 miles. Now, VMG, if you're a non-sailor and you're just following the adventure, you probably don't even know what it is, but vector made good is, is something like this, that if, if the boat's here, and if for whatever reason decides to sail out like that, vector made good is, is how much uh, distance it's made good towards the finish down here. 
So it's a, it's a calculation. If he goes out to the side, you could say, if you draw a line across here, he's only made that much distance towards the finish. So it's, it's a, it needs a bit of a mental calculation or a, or a few assumptions to get a general feel for the vector made good towards the finish. Um, and it's not, it's not too straightforward. That's why it's only showing vector made good. Uh, the speed of vector made good is only 3.6 knots because the boat might be doing six or seven knots, but that's the vector made good uh, speed. Okay, and then um, the 24 hour distance made good, all right? That means uh, in relation to the, t the, 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 the plots over a 24 hour period, it sailed 92 nautical miles, okay? And it's always a good thing to look at because it gives you averages and you can see, you know, they'll consistently be doing usually about 100 miles a day. Uh, they've had it tough when they're going to windward, they're a lot slower, but you'll also see it, you know, stretch out 150, 160 mile days if they're having a rip of time. So uh, based on the vector made good speed, right? This 3.6 knots, okay? Um, the estimated finish time back in the Saab de Lone would be the 1st of July at 2.31 in the afternoon. Now, you can see he's only doing 3.6 knots. Later on, you'll see that speed go up to 6 knots or something. When it's 6 knots, you'll see this estimated finish time go back to sort of like March or something like that. You know, so it's, a, it's, a, it's really a fictitious figure at the moment. It doesn't make much sense because we're on a round-the-world course. But if you're only on a 500-mile race, which is using the same format, it's probably a lot more relevant. And the same thing again on the elapsed time. So based on this 3.6 knots, it's going to take about, Vector made good, it's going to take about 300 days to finish the course. So I'm quite certain that Simon's going to finish the course, touch wood if he gets a bit of luck, in a lot better time than 300 days. So, uh, so you know, these are funny figures. Don't, don't get too carried away with them for now. Um, the corrected elapsed time, well, that's, they're the same because we don't have handicapping. So these corrected times here are a bit of irrelevant, but it's a standard format for Yellow Brick who give us the, the program. So there's just a little bit of information there on um, what some of those numbers mean and, and the fact that we don't control the program that, that comes up with this data. If there is a major glitch, in other words, something that's not correcting normally, we talk to Yellow Brick, they give us great service, they, uh, we're one of their bigger events and we have have, you know, we'll, we'll end up with millions of, of hits on the tracker and uh, they look after us well. So bear with us if you're seeing some funny data. Uh, it, it sometimes might take eight hours, you know, it might take two plots, especially if it's in the middle of the night because they're working office hours in England where it comes from. Anyway, back to, uh, back to the race. The good news is the, the dramas seem to be over, although there's still some pretty solid winds up here. Um, but first we'll, we'll look at Damien. So this is the current weather for today. Uh, you can see Damien's fallen in a bit of a hole, although he's doing okay. He was doing four knots uh, at uh, four o'clock UTC this morning, uh, where it looks as if he's got very little wind there. If I blow this up, it might be a bit small on your screen. Uh, here we go. Okay, you can see he's in a bit of a hole. Uh, and uh, if we move the, the weather forward a day, okay, uh, he still had some challenges. So it's not going to be a fast day for Damien, but it's still pretty good because this, this low pressure system's coming across the right way. He'll end up reaching out across there. And if we go another couple of days, 15th, yeah, it's going to roll around. So uh, he's not going to be beating to windward. He's going to be making, by the time this is on, this is two days' time, he's going to be over here and it's going to be favourable sailing for him. So he's he's certainly um, not looking too bad. You know, he hasn't had a huge disadvantage by uh, going back and he'll start um, catching up with Arnaud. Anyway, so back to the main part of the fleet. Um, there's some big wins here. You know, you heard yesterday uh, Urton was getting 40 knots. Um, this is showing in the forecasting colour range. Remembering if you're watching this again, you can see the estimated wind strength down here by these colours. So that's up around here. So it's forecasting about 28, maybe 30 knots, which means it can easily be gusting to 40 knots. Okay, so uh, Mark Sinclair said he was hove to on his tweet this morning, fixing up one of his bilge pumps. Um, and I don't know whether he's hove to because of the weather or because he needed to fix the pump, but I'd say it's the weather. So again, uncomfortable seas for Mark, um, but it's not going to last too much longer. And our Nord's on the back end of this thing, so uh, he'll be um, you know, getting a bit of heavy weather as well, making 4.5 knots, which is respectable. And Mark is making 2.6 knots hove to, as we're saying. Um, it's not a dangerous thing because uh, if we look at the sea state, it, it won't be small but we wouldn't expect any real trouble, touch wood. Um, 
we'll just see what sort of waves they've got here. I'm hitting the, the wave format there. And yeah, okay, it's gonna be a, a good solid five meters. Um, you come down here again, you can see, you know, it's in this range, so it's four to five meters, see, uh, on the nose, so that's why he's slowed up. There's still a, a bit of a sea running here. This is three to four still, so, um, you know, it's, it's pretty reasonable. Um, and uh, the good news is they, if I go back to the, to the wind, virtually the rest of the fleet is looking very good because uh, they've all got good wind direction and it starts to show. Kirsten's gone right out to the west and not going to pick up a huge advantage on that, but she's flying. She's doing 7.6 knots, so she's having a ball. It's probably blowing quite solid. This is sort of 25 to 28 knots in here, and that's going to come across her. It's on the starboard quarter, which is absolutely perfect for these boats. They'll be, she'll be just roaring along, which shows. That's what the track is even showing. That's an average speed over four hours, by the way. So average speed, 7.6 knots, um, not too bad at all. Elliot's doing four knots. He's probably... Um, Got it right behind him now. Um, this, the centre of this low is moving reasonably, uh, you know, not, not, not fast, but it's definitely heading out to the to the east. So uh, his wind direction will start moving around. He's, he's running dead downwind now, so he's okay. Ian Herbert Jones on starboard tack and uh, making 3.7 knots uh, because he this would have gone over him. So there's not a lot of wind in the middle, but as as it moves away, he'll come into this higher wind band and pick up speed as, as well. Guy de Boer, 6.7, he's doing okay. Um, uh, Michael Goog, 6.9, he's flying. Um, we've got uh, Guy Waits, 6.4. Erton 4.2, so he's still taking it a bit easy. Um, he hasn't mentioned his furling gear again, but I'd, I'd imagine uh, because of that he's not too worried. So it might have been a halyard wrap, <coughs> which um, which he would be able to see by now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, Jeremy Bagshaw, uh, he's got 4.6 knots. Uh, you know, wind might have been a bit softer. He's in between these two bands here. He's had a bit, and also it's early morning. He might have been just getting some sleep. Maybe uh, it's not uncommon. Pat, 6.7, Tapio, 6.2, uh, Simon, 6.2, and Tapio's right on his hammer there. So there's a nice little race happening here. And this is, this is pretty much boat for boat now, and this could tell us a bit about the boats themselves. So watch this space, because they're going to both get generally the same weather. Uh, if we look at Abelis, 6.9, so he's on the hammer as well, and uh, going faster than Tapio. Probably possibly because of, uh, well, he's on the beam. Yeah, they're both on the beam. Anyway, this, this is where it starts to get really interesting. The good news, what we're going to see now, is uh, is a real boat race. So they're not going to windward anymore. That was pretty, uh, you know, just yuck coming out of Bay of Biscay. Uh, virtually the whole fleet now is into uh, a situation where they're going to roll down towards Lanzarote. Uh, that's probably a bit too small. Hang on, I'll come back here. I'll put it on, leave it on wind, I'll get rid of that, and then I'll show you Lanzarote, we might just get it in here, not quite, um, okay, here's Lanzarote down here, okay, and I'm going to roll through the weather, so the Lanzarote is just below the screen, okay, and here's the fleet here, and you can see what's going to happen now with the weather going down as I scroll it through every day, this is what they're going to get, so we're on wind, so now I want to, oops, uh, I will just bring it forward a day. Okay, so it's not, yeah, this is about a day. You can see it's lightening off, but the wind direction is all good. Okay, so for the whole fleet, they're going to get really nice sailing conditions. That's the first thing. And if we immediately trot that, this is a day ahead. If we look at the waves, they should all be dying down. You should start to see the, the red starting to disappear or the purple, and it's starting to go blue. Now, when it gets into the blues, it's getting below two, two metres. Uh, it's all following seas or on the beam. It'll be really nice. They won't be breaking. So they're going to finally start to enjoy the ride. Um, so that's the, that's the good news. We go back to wind again and we'll go another day ahead. Uh, so 14, we'll click that on. Right, Got to get right on the line. There's 15, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Same again, it's, it's light. So they're going to be still doing speeds, I reckon, of sort of around fives. Okay, not doing sevens and halves for, for as, but they'll still make five knots. So they're going to be, uh, you know, 120 mile days, uh, a little bit more. So that's, that's to the 15th. And then we go to the 16th, you're still starting to see it now, starting to kick in. So it'll be a fast fly to the finish. 
they'll start to at least keep up with Bernardo Tessio and Joshua. They might start to catch him as we go south. So, uh, so all a bit of fun. Anyway, it's all uh, looking quite good. The dramas or the the, the yuck part of trying to get out of the baby skies over. Uh, you'll see the, the the tweets coming up. They'll all start to sound a bit happier, and uh, it's a real boat race. I'm wondering whether Simon's actually worked out where he is yet because Tapio's pretty active on the VHF. He'll do some blind calls. They're getting very close to. Uh, uh, each other in fact I'll I'll do a tag on that I'll just blow it all up and just show you how close they are in relative terms Oops. okay here we go to the toggle put that there boom boom and then we can move them so Abolish is here and uh, let's say Simon is there Abolish is 81 miles behind Simon and if we bring this down here this will be fun to watch um, okay, they're only 14 miles apart, which is nothing. It's a couple of hours sailing, and they would they would absolutely be in VHF range now. Um, Pat from Simon, well, distance apart is uh, 55 miles, but if we bring this at loss in terms of the course, Pat is only uh, 30 miles behind the leader, really, because they're both heading in the same direction. So that's kind of interesting. And then if we go back to... Uh, Go back to the other guys, uh, 100 miles behind. So Guy de Boer and the others, they're 100 miles off the mark. Jeremy's looking there. Kirsten's uh, lucked out a bit here because the, the the wind gradient, you know, the direction is going to be pretty consistent now. She's going to go, you know, but she's probably 150 miles behind them. So that's a day, a day and a bit in terms of sailing. So it's going to be hard for her to catch them before Lanzarote. But uh, nonetheless, all a bit of fun. And uh, we're uh, we're looking at a real boat race now. And the guys are having fun, and the girls. So that's it. Thanks a lot. And happy to see uh, Seb. We've all been pretty busy. We're a small team. Seb's uh, managed to get a, a French track live update uh, up. And uh, that will become...